and welcome to the first episode of Dig Up the Pit, finding the fans at history's greatest gigs. I'm Jessica, and I'm here to give a voice to the nameless faces that have spanned generations of concert footage. I want to find the fanatics, the people who go a little crazier than everyone around them. If you go to any good show, there's always that guy going mental. I want to talk to that guy. I am sometimes that guy. For our first show, we're going to Bad Brains, CBGB's Christmas Eve, 1982. This is some of the most revered footage of the early punk movement. The film is a masterpiece. The camera crew get right there in the chaos, yet they still capture the incredible performance by Bad Brains. I watched this footage a lot during the pandemic because it just makes you feel like you're right there at a show. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Bad Brains, they were pioneers of punk rock, the first to fuse hardcore with reggae. Fight each other. While many punk bands were criticized, and some even reveled in their lack of musical ability, not Bad Brains. Besides creating these angry, howling punk anthems for a disenfranchised youth, they were virtuosos of their craft. I could go on and on about that, but we're not here to talk about Bad Brains. We're here to talk about the crowd, to dig up the pit. Okay, start of the show, and HR has to run to the back because Mohawk Guy storms on stage, skanking around, looking like the cartoon character of the era. And the chaos ensues. It's Christmas Eve. Yeah, they're feeling festive. Check out the girl in the red plaid shirt on the side of the stage. This woman is my hero. Okay, the cassette had only been out for a few months, and my girl here knows every word. She's just chilling, hanging out, not at all intimidated by the band or the crazy, angry punk dudes around her. Her presence is such a huge part of what makes this footage so special. You've got this young woman on the side of the stage who knows every word, singing along to an African-American punk band. This film proves that punk rock was never just about white dudes. Women and people of color have been in hardcore since the start. Blonde girl in the red plaid shirt has captured the imagination of many punk boys on Reddit over the years, pontificating the identity of this mega babe, and of course by many female fans like myself who are so underrepresented in punk and hardcore documentaries. You go anywhere online where this footage is shared, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, there's always a comment asking, who is that girl in the red plaid shirt? Well, I found her. Internet, allow me to introduce you to the first star of Dig Up the Pit, Polly. Hi, Jessica. So good to see you. Here you are, one of history's coolest punk fans. So let's start with that night at CBGB's. Uh, it was Christmas Eve. CBGB's was my home. Never mind the cold outside. It must have been a blizzard, but it was like 110 degrees in there. It smelled like Dog shit, stale beer, and Chanel number no. five. <laughs> What's so bracing about this footage is the inhibition that's on display. Were you all aware that it was being filmed? Absolutely not. I had no clue. I was just watching the pit. There was like one camera on the side, and you don't even get to see the bass player. You don't get to see Daryl, okay? But <laughs> you see me. And also from the PA system he had up there. So we didn't know it was being filmed at all. We were just being ourselves. And as you see from the beginning in that DVD, you see John Watson doing his skank move. Hare Krishna, John, and it's, it's just home. It was family back then. We were all kids, you know? And Christmas Eve, it was like, that's what we did. The first time I heard the Bad Brains, I remember seeing them before the Roar cassette band in DC came out. I'd seen them many a times before that. They were phenomenal. And they knew us, we knew them. They were recording at 171 on Avenue A and 11th Street that tape, the Roar cassette. But we were all together the whole time. It was like a family. All the bands would play, everybody would be there. I don't think there's a show I ever missed. What was it about those Bad Brain songs and those lyrics that you loved so much? Everything. 
I mean, word for word, I knew it because I've seen him so many times before the cassette came out. And I loved the music. I must have drove my mother crazy when they did I Love Ja. Don't follow Bobby Line, Ja will lead the way. When he started saying that with the reggae tune, my mother was singing I Love My Job. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was in the Greenwich Village folk scene, beatnik scene, and my father too. It took off like Carly Simon, Stephen Stills, Bob Dylan. My father was heavily into the blues, so I was exposed at a young age. What age do you think you were when you saw your first gig? I think I was two, and I threw up on Carly Simon. <laughs> We used to go to the Cafe Figaro and eat falafels and the, my mom would take me to Max's to see the dolls and Tony Bennett's sons, the quacky duckies. I remember one day I was going to my high school at Quintano School for Young Professionals. It actually had less than 40 kids in it. And there was this kid sitting on the mailbox, Didi Ramon style, Andy Apathy from Urban Waste. And he was like, I'm playing at Max's. And I'm like, yeah, right, okay. And I went there and I was like, wow, there's another movement, it's hardcore. And that's where I got to meet Vinny from Agnostic Front, everybody. It was like, I found my tribe, put it that way. And what did your mother and, and your family who's into blues think of, think of your uh, taste in hardcore and punk rock? It was a family tradition. I mean, my grandparents lived up in Riverdale and they would make me leave the building from the garage so the neighbors wouldn't see me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's been said a lot of documentaries about violence in the hardcore community, but they always talk about men. What was it like being a woman in the hardcore scene? There was a lot of stuff going on, like crazy, crazy dangerous stuff. You had, you know, Hell's Angels, junkies, drugs, running rampant, really scary stuff. Avenue A was a war zone, and the Bowery was the Bowery. It was horrid. I mean, the bottom of the bottom was pit, but the women really were just there. And if we got in trouble with something, the guys looked after us. They weren't our boyfriends, it wasn't anything sexual. They were our friends. They were our guardians, you know, agnostic front, everybody. We were all together in it. I mean, at that age, you don't comprehend those things. You just know it's, that's where you're supposed to be, you know for the music and for the support and for just camaraderie. And it was just so communal. I had no fear. There are a lot of interesting characters in this footage. Did you know any of these other faces? Sure, I knew everybody just about. When you open up the video, the DVD of Live at CBGB's 1982, Angelica, you see her with a mohawk, one of the women, and she's Rip Torn and Geraldine Page's daughter. The Bad Brains instilled in us PMA, positive mental attitude. If you want to do something, visualize it and you can achieve it. If you want to go someplace, go there. He was so filled with peace. I mean, one day he came over to my house and I wasn't there and he was talking to my mother for like four hours. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He was like, I had a long conversation with your mother. I was like, great. And my mother was like, he's got good wisdom. And Gary, he was pre-med. And Daryl and Earl, HR's brother, was laid back, calm, cool, and collected. I always wanted to be like him. You said you were quite close with Johnny Ramone. Tell us about your friendship with him. You yeah, said his girlfriend at the time, Roxy, befriended me. I had no idea she was with Johnny. I went over to her house. I think it was 10th Street, yeah, right around the block from the Ritz. Cynthia Whitney and I befriended each other, and I see all these baseball cards, and I'm looking at a big statue of the original alien. <laughs> and pictures of Johnny and her, and I'm like, this is Johnny's house, uh-oh. I'm in trouble here. <laughs> I can hear him say it. He, he was so great, he used to show me on Betamax. For those who don't know what that is, that was how you saw movies at home back in the day. We'd watch scary, scary, scary movies like The Evil Dead. <laughs> he would get a kick out of scaring me. 
and he'd be like to his girlfriend, Roxy, Cynthia, cover the baby if I was sleeping, and he would tell me, don't drink. And he'd go, I have maybe one beer a day if I go to a Yankee game. And he didn't drink or do drugs, so I admired that in him. And he was always there for me when I needed advice. <laughs> Bad Brains went to, I think Diego was the singer of Agnostic Front at the time, and he had the Bad Brains play at the house in Long Island. It was like, if you ever saw the Metallica video, Whiskey in the Jaro, it was 10 times worse. <laughs> I mean, people flying out the window, throwing up, everything. And Adam Harwood from the Beastie Boys, the Beastie Boys was a punk rock hardcore band. So you saw the Beastie Boys as a hardcore act? Oh, sure. Yeah, with Kate Belenchat, who started Luscious Jackson. They were the Beastie Girls. It was pretty cool. In fact, in the footage, in the video footage, you actually see one of the Beastie Girls, Tanya, who sailed around the world by herself and asked me to come with her at the time. And my parents were like, no. But we all really got along well. There was no animosity, jealousy, or everything. We were just there for the music. Over the years, people online have speculated about your identity. Anytime you go anywhere online where the Bad Brains show is being shown, you always see people commenting, who is that girl in the red plaid shirt? <laughs> and some people have responded with answers such as, she's a nun now, there's an interview somewhere. Uh, another person said, uh, she's a VP at a brokerage firm. Okay. Uh, a third person mentioned, oh, that's got to be a girlfriend of one of the band members. And then the last one said, oh, that's Polly. She used to go out with Doug from Cro-Mag. Right. Care to confirm or deny any of those? Okay, I wanted to be a luthier, which is a guitar builder. So I guess the people that heard me say that, we thought I was going to be a luthier nun. <laughs> so... No, and I never became a luthier, even though my mom was good friends with a lot of luthiers. She got my uncle a job working for Stuart Spector, who's a bass maker, and he made Gene Simmons' hatchet bass. I wish I was the VP of a brokerage firm, <laughs> you know, and it was never about boyfriend and girlfriend with the bad brains. It was always trust and one love and everything. We were all together. I had a huge crush on Doug from the Cro-Mags. I thought he was brilliant and he probably still is. I love the Cro-Mags. The mosh pit wasn't so violent back then. Later on, it became violent. It was more like a tribal dance. We would jump in, and then I'd have, like, Jimmy Gestapo or Jimmy G right in front of me with pass on his shoulders. The girls were always protected. I mean, if you started swinging on our turf from out of town, we would put you right back in your place. It wasn't so violent as it is today. That's really, they don't know what it's about. Like I said, it was more of a tribal dance and a release of energy. And people don't realize we started slam dancing. People magazine I was in back in the day, and people were like, is that you? And I'm like, no. Because <laughs> my grandparents' friends were looking at it, and I'm like, there's Polly, and I'm like, that's not me. <laughs> Double life. What kind of music are you listening to nowadays? I listen to like, I love the Foo Fighters. Dave Grohl loves the Bad Brains too. I really like a lot of different music, like the new Billy Idol album. I listen to old music, really. I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm glad they got John Fashante back. If you could see any band of your choice tonight at any venue, tickets are on me, you and I going to a show, who do you want to see? Cheap Trick? No. <laughs> If they were alive, the Ramones. Anyone, alive or dead. A hardcore show or a punk rock show or music of today's show? Any show, any band. I'd like to see Mind of Threat and SSD Control and the band. I'm up for that. Definitely. I'm well up for that. And okay, what venue? Any place in the world. Where do you want to go see Mind of Threat? Irving Plaza. People don't mention that. It was great. And it was like a Ukrainian hall. And it was had about. I've been there many times. I have. So many wonderful memories of Irving Plaza, and you're right, it rarely gets talked about. I've never heard anybody talk about it. I remember we were all in like the women's bathroom, had like a huge foyer with a mirror, 
and we all had a class picture. I wish I had that picture to send you. Somebody must have it out there. If they do, please send it to me, of all of us together in the, in, in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but Irving Plaza was the place to be. I loved it. Now, in some of these photos that I've got of you, you're holding a guitar. Do you play music yourself? Yeah, I play bass guitar. I used to play at age four. My mom and my dad would teach me, you know, a nylon acoustic guitar, but I never really excelled at it. I always loved the bass, so I picked up the bass, A, because it's easy, <laughs> and B, because nobody plays it. And I used to love the way Bill Wyman from the Rolling Stones looked, or John Entwistle looked from The Who. No cares, just no emotions whatsoever except the music. That's why I wanted to be a bass player. Were there women uh, in the scene that you really admired? The Runaways were my idols. Susie Quattro, Joan Jett, extremely was in love with Joan Jett. In fact, Johnny Ramone was, took me to see Joan Jett open up for them. Blondie, X-Ray Specs from London, Polystyrene, go way back. The Sick Fucks, who are Tish and Snooky from Manic Panic. And Kitty Hawk and Caroline's band. The name escapes me, but they used to do this song, Bombs Away. Sorry, Kitty, I don't remember. <laughs> but they were the first girl hardcore band in our scene. I'm just so thankful that you, you know, connected with me and are sharing your story with everybody. And it's like, you know, you're a conduit into what, you know, that era and what that show was like, you know for all of us who weren't there. I tried to sell that flannel shirt to somebody and because I had it signed by the Bad Brains at the last show at CBGB's. And I don't have it anymore, unfortunately. If I did, I'm sure I'd put it up on eBay or something. Well, it was really amazing talking to you, Polly. And if there's anything else you want to tell us, just let us know. <laughs> Women, get out there. Definitely start a band. It doesn't matter if you suck. We all sucked, okay? <laughs> but it gets better as you go on. And I, I love seeing girls in bands. Rock on. PMA, positive mental attitude no matter what. At least I do. That's what's gotten me through the rough times. And there's been a lot of rough times. And for all you kids out there, do the right thing. Thank you for watching our first episode of Dig Up the Pit. To keep this series going, I need your help, music fanatics. If there's any concert footage you want me to investigate, pop a link in the comments below. If you know someone who was captured in some concert footage, if your grandma was showing her tits at Danzig in the 80s, email me your GILFs number, I will call her up, and we will discuss our shared love of Glenn. And help me find these people. I'm looking for you, Rage Against the Machine's first fan who creates a one-man mosh pit outside their first ever performance at the University of California Northridge. I'm looking for your mom at Leonard Skinner's first UK performance at the Nebworth Fair in Hertfordshire in 1976. Or maybe this guy who throws his shirt in the air the first time he hears Freebird. I'm looking for you, skinny white dude who goes nuts from the first note at LL Cool J's Unplugged. You were doing it well. Creating this episode was so much fun and I can't wait to make more for you. Subscribe below so you'll know when I found somebody cool. I'm Jessica with Dig Up The Pit. Hey, real quick, before I go, I've got one more thing I wanna talk about. Now this series is all about historic gigs, which are really fun to revisit, but in order to immunize ourselves against the disease of nostalgia, I think it's really important we take a brief minute to talk about music that is being made right now. If you wanna be on a future episode of Dig Up The Pit, go to a show tonight and go nuts. I'd like to end each episode spending one minute talking about a band who currently tours. Since this episode is all about punk rock, it's gotta be a mill and the sniffers. I saw them in London last summer and oh my God, one of the best sets of the year. Now, how have these 20 year old from Backwater Australia take the sound of first wave punk rock and make it seem new and relevant? with the lyrics. Check out the songs Capital or Knifey if you want to hear a modern day invective. Musicianship is incredible across the band. Uh, guitar player Declan Martins is amazing. 
such a dream boat. But the main attraction is, of course, the incomparable front woman, Amy Taylor. She's like this tiny little one-woman celebration of female sexuality in punk rock. This was at uh, Victoria Park for the All Points East Festival. The weather was pretty good all day, except for 10 minutes in the middle of a Milne Sniffer set, it pours down rain. There are a lot of things that British people are not good at, but one thing they are amazing at is moshing in the rain. The pit just seemed to absorb it. Uh, Amy Taylor was running back and forth on the stage, sliding around, humping the stage. I jumped over the woman in front of me into the security pit, took off my underpants, threw them at Amy's feet. She gave me a fuck yeah, and then I ran off high-fiving all the other chicks in the crowd. I'm 44 years old. I should be ashamed of myself, but I'm not, because that show was awesome. So yeah, Amil and the Sniffers, they tour constantly. If they are anywhere near you, go to their show. This is a show you will tell your grandchildren about, I promise. Okay, that really is all I've got to say. Um, episode two is in the cooker, and it's going to be really good. I'll see you soon.